And if you read the Bible with the Holy Spirit showing you, Hello, praise the Lord today. Um, it was just been really on my heart lately to share a word that the Lord gave me um, a little while back and it just keeps coming to me and I've been procrastinating on it and I'm like, Lord, <laughs> and it's entitled uh, Reverence for God and I did speak it a little while back, but um, it has since been removed. Uh, from the other platform, but but um, it's a very important subject, and it's part of my praise and worship uh, teaching that I have, and it's it's the opening um, address. Very important because without the fear of God, how can we worship? You know, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth if we have no reverence or fear for the Lord. And so this is um something I want to share with us today. But before I begin, I want to establish a, a foundation. The Lord has been showing me something that is very important and that has an effect on every aspect of our lives and um, on my life, on your life. And uh, without this one thing, we might as well just pack up and go home and, you know, um, close the doors of the church, close the door to the fellowships, you know. This one element of our worship, if, if we don't have the fear of God and the reverence of God, our, our worship becomes uh, shallow and, and it's just a lot of surface noise. So, Lord, I praise you today. I thank you, Lord, that um, we can come to you in spirit and truth and we can I uh, worship you through the blood of the Lamb by faith today, Lord. And Lord, just I pray today we would have an awesome fear and reverence for your name. Lord God, we would bow down in your presence, Lord, and just tremble at your name. Lord, we would be grateful people today. We would be grateful for your love, grateful, Lord God, that you are mindful of us, Lord, and that you care for us, Lord. I praise your holy name today, Lord. May this word go deep in our spirits, Father. May we be changed and transformed. Renew our minds, renew our hearts, Lord, by, by your word today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, we're going to look at John 4, 23 and 24. So let's look at John. John 4. 23 and 24. Hallelujah. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is a spirit. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth hallelujah we must begin with reverence for god hallelujah hallelujah the word worship um, in this verse is used over 60 times in the new testament so this tells us what um that it's very important it's a very important 
word, worship. And it's translated from the Greek, Greek word proskunio, which means to kiss. Like a dog is licking his master's hand, to fawn, to crouch, to prostrate oneself in homage, to do reverence, to adore, to worship, which means to make obeisance, to bow, in other words, to bow. Pros means towards, and kunio means to kiss. Kiss towards. Hallelujah. And worship is to be focused on paying tribute to God and God alone. This is a mindset. We get this word uh, from Pascunio. It's a physical, and yet um, it also involves our attitudes that we have toward God, right? It's where I recognize that I am less or you know, not as much, and God is more, you know, God is more than us, above us, and I have to say, true worship is much deeper than this even, and let's look at, let's look at Hebrews 12, 28 to 29, Hebrews 12, 28 to 29, therefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence, reverence, and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. As worshipers, we must fear God and serve him, and in order to do this, we need to have a mindset of reverence and awe because of his what? His majesty, his holiness. We're just not free to walk in any old way we want into the presence of God and, and, um, and present to him our worship. And, and I think with all these new gods today in a lot of our churches, I don't think Moses would have to, to, to remove his shoes. You know, he could just walk in, doesn't have to take his shoes off because it's not really a holy place. And John, you know, the apostle John fall at his feet as dead. You know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't fall at his feet as dead. And this revised God, and it is a revised God. This revised God doesn't care about how we come into his presence anymore. You know, there's, there's a hundred thousand ways to come into his presence and they're all right. No, that is not true. We have to be careful about everything we do in his presence. And I have to say that to change God in any way, to change him, is to deny him and to insult him. So, where is the reverence for God today? Even in our own lives. I mean, let's examine our own lives. Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the Old Testament Jehovah? You know, where his glory filled the temple and the Shekinah glory. Where, where you know, Isaiah fell, fell as though he was dead and said, whoa, I've become undone. You know, where is the mighty God that so respectfully addressed in the recorded prayers of the New Testament of the saints in the New Testament? I mean, the Lord Jesus himself when he was living out his life of perfect righteousness, had the deepest reverence for his father, even Jesus. The Bible tells us that his prayers were heard because he feared, you know, using the same Greek term for caution or reverence. Hebrews 5, 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. The term fear indicates a reverential fear. And it appears many times in the New Testament. For example, Cornelius, when he was visited by Peter, you know, he was known by all to be one who feared God, who reverenced, you know, God. His reverence for God was seen by everybody. 
you know, can people say that about us today? I hope so. I hope so. And before I even, you know, the, the Lord had me put this message together and he was speaking to me, I had to go into the secret closet and I had, Lord, check my own heart. Do I have the fear and reverence of God in my own life? We look at Paul when he was preaching in, in Antioch. You know, Paul appealed twice to those who f that feared God using the same reverential fear term here. You know, they were the people who truly received the word. Peter wrote, fear God using the same term in 1 Peter 2.17. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Fear God, said the angel of the preaching of the everlasting gospel in Revelation, using the same term, indicating that the ultimate objective of the gospel is to bring men and women not just to salvation, but to reverence. Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. The victorious people of God sang, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord? And glorify thy name using the same reverential fear term. Revelation 15, 4. And the voice from the throne of God commanded, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Revelation 19, 5. I think we're getting the picture here. And there's a parable of the wicked husbandman, right? The Lord spoke of a householder who let out his property. And when he sent servants to get the produce, they were beaten and killed and stoned. And finally, the householder sent his only son, saying, they'll surely reverence my son. Reverence, respect, and worship is exactly what we owe to the eternal son of God the Lord of glory. Amen. And how we express this reverence is first and foremost seen in our worship. And if it's not there, it won't be there in any other area of our life either. Worship that isn't reverent will leave us feeling shallow, even in our commitment to the Lord, in our seriousness and in our depth. There won't be any depth and even in the holiness and in, in how we live and, you know, um, reverence the Lord. Reverence and worship is vital for believers and must be maintained. We have to maintain it. And how do we maintain this reverence and fear in our lives? How do we do that? Well, let's look at another very valuable passage about reverence. And it's found in 1 Timothy 4, 7 to 9. Let's look at that. <coughs> 1 Timothy 4, 7 to 9. But reject profane and old wives' fables. And exercise yourself toward godliness, for bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having a promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Hallelujah. So Paul is saying to Timothy, exercise yourself. Rather, to godliness. For godliness, you know, is, is where it's at. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Now, to show the importance of these words, Paul also makes a comment. 
He makes the comment, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. What is Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking about the need of reverence toward God. And we might think that the key word in these verses is godliness. Well, um, because it points. It points to righteous character. And so we think that Paul is saying, um, exercise yourself to in sanctified living. And this would be right. It's a right thing to do. But the word godliness doesn't mean that in this case. And, and I'll, I'll explain. As I've been looking up certain words in the Greek and the Hebrew meanings, uh, I see that this word godliness is very a very special word with a very distinctive meaning. The Greek is yesubia, meaning well devout. And it refers to our entire attitude toward God, everything. It's far more specific than just righteousness. This is so important. So let's look at other passages where the word is used, okay? And we'll come back to this. 1 Timothy 6.11. says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Hmm. We see something interesting here. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. So here, Godliness is listed in a very distinctive um, group. It's not a general term for Christian living because it takes place in a list of, of very particular virtues. The term is used in the same way in the list of 2 Peter 1, 5-7. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So godliness, again, sits in a very specific virtue with, with the others. It's all about the fear of God. Humility before God. Amen? And reverence toward God. I think the root to all our problems today, I mean, is a lack of reverence, the fear of God. And we have so many new styles of worship today, you know, and, and it, we're, we're just not careful in God's presence. Oh, and we don't have this deep respect and honor for him. It's, it's been removed in a lot of cases. I'm not saying in every case. And yet this is the ultimate purpose of salvation. Right? It's, it's to revere and obey God. So really what Paul is saying here is exercise yourself to reverence. Right? It, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. That revelation came to me. Exercise yourself to reverence the Lord. This needs to be our foundation. The fear of God. Proverbs talks all about it. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge, you know? And a lot of believers today say, you know, I want this joy. I want to be happy. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want this great experience with the Lord. I want to encounter the Lord. You know, I want His glory in my life. And this is okay, but it only comes through the fear and reverence of God. God must always be this great, awesome God to us you know this holy holy and sacred god we must hold him in respect if we want this fullness of the holy spirit and we want this true joy we have to live in a life that is submitted to him and in reverence for him hallelujah if we hate reverence if, if we want to distance ourselves from it and we see it as some gloomy alternative to, to our joy in Christ, right? And, and some people do, <laughs> and I don't understand that. I mean, maybe there was a time in my own life where I was like that as well. You know, um, then, then it's all a facade. 
It's all a facade. It's something that we work up. And it's going to be very, very shallow. All of our worship music, I mean, can't work up real joy. Because it's not rooted in the music. It's not in the music itself. It's rooted in our reverence and fear and our awe for God. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we need to be careful. And I know Richard and I stress this a lot when we talk. I mean, this subject keeps coming up when we're talking. I mean, these, these new worship styles today, and it's something the Lord has really, really impressed in our heart. You know, um, even down to how it's presented, you know, in darkness to create a mood. You know, we got to create a mood. God is not interested in creating a mood. He wants us to come to him in spirit and in truth, in reverence and in awe. But all these new styles of worship today is the Lord has been showing us. We need to be careful that it's not an entertainment style music, that it's not a shallow, just a surface worship. Paul in giving Timothy his exhortation about God, he says, refuse pro profane and old wives' fables. We can't ju do what is just popular down the street, what, you know, what other churches are doing or what we see on the internet, um, what's happening at Bethel, what's happening at uh, Hillsong, because you know what? What's happening down the street, they could be dead wrong. They could be you know, breeding unholy traditions, so to speak. And no doubt, many of these fable teachers here had a lot of charm, like a lot of our worship leaders do today and our pastors, and they have a lot of charm. You know, their stories are, are very impressive and they know how to deliver a good message. And, and, and the music is spot on. It's, it's, it's perfect. You know, it's all mass produced and they got the fog lights going and all these lights and colors and the big screens behind them and the worship leader is portrayed and humongous and, and, and it, you know, just everything seems just perfect and just right. No. <laughs> However, in commanding Timothy to refuse them, and Paul did command Timothy to refuse them, refuse them, he said. Paul is using an interesting word here. He calls these fables profane. And this is a word that indicates um, the opposite of reverence and respect. The Greek word for profane literally refers to a threshold walker or someone who is free and easy and does whatever they please, whatever they like. He does not have any reverence and no sense of caution no fear no respect for any place you know the fable teachers here had no reverence and respect for the word of god they just made things up and they passed them on as the truth as biblical teaching we need to be careful that we're not doing the same thing even in our worship you know that we're not doing the same thing we need to realize that there is a God in heaven who will hold us accountable and hold us responsible for everything we do, everything we say in his name. There was no fear in these, these teachers, these false teachers. So Paul is saying, refuse them, refuse their profane, freewheeling fables, because such people are not governed by reverence. They're not governed by respect or carefulness with regard to scripture. And, and I apply that to our worship because a lot of the songs that we sing today um, or even back in the day, they're, they're based on the biblical teaching, the doctrines of the church. You know, so our, our songs have to be scripturally based or else we're singing a lie. And it's just as dangerous to sing a lie as it is to speak a lie. Speaking and singing, both the same thing. It was teachers just like this, so many of them in our history, who were the first to fall away from traditional ways, you know, the traditional worship. 
Now, now I'm speaking not only to us today, but <laughs> to myself as a worship leader and any other potential leaders. In a lot of our churches today, true worship has been substituted with entertainment. Come on, guys. We see this. You scroll the, the YouTube channels. Scroll them, and you'll see. Everyone wants to be a star. Everyone wants to be, you know, famous and popular. And it's got to be done so perfectly. No. No. It's all a show, the showbiz style of worship. Richard and I say it's a showbiz style of worship. And, and it's, it's been the product of profane teaching. Listen to the lyrics. Um, the rec reckless love of God. No, God's love is not reckless. He's a responsible God. And he loves us responsibly. And um, you didn't want heaven without us, so you brought heaven down to us no that's that's not listen to the words we're singing listen to those words reverence in a lot of ways has become all emotionalism we're not to be celebrities we're not to be showing off our personalities or our talents and behaving in an entirely flippant and irreverent manner in the presence of a holy god yes we can be joyful you know, and we can have um, fun in his presence. I mean, in a healthy, clean way, in a holy way. But reverence um, knows how to honor and respect. But for some, it's become a burden and depressing. Reverence is a door to a lot of blessing in our lives. It's not depressing. <laughs> as well, you know, as, as in eternity, not just for this earth. So as Paul says in this passage, in 1 Timothy 4, 7, exercise thyself unto godliness. And the word godliness, as we've seen, refers to the reverence and respect of God. The Greek word translated exercise literally means gymnasticize. <laughs> so Paul is saying gymnasticize yourself to practice reverence. Practice it. Put it into action. You know, go over it every day. Make sure you're walking in that reverence and fear of God. I mean, think about the time when we were first born again. We were so excited. And we were filled with, with this great reverence and awe for God. And it was awesome. It was all so wonderful and, and awesome. He was awesome. God was awesome. And we feared his name. But we can lose that sense of awe. So God says it must be exercise. We know that exercise is physical. You know, it, it's in the physical realm. And it doesn't uh, make, it, it has to be developed. You know, it will certainly develop our muscles, right? We're in the physical realm. We, we have to exercise our muscles by using them, <laughs> you know. And it's the same with reverence. Reverence comes with the new nature, but exercise is, is a must to strengthen, right? And keep, keep it in our lives. That reverence, we have to exercise it daily, that awe and reverence for the Lord. So Paul isn't putting down exercise, you know, when he says for bodily exercise profiteth, profiteth or profiteth, <laughs> suffering succotash. <laughs> profits a little now this could mean for a little but i think it could also mean for bodily exercise profits to a little to a little so when paul is saying is that um exercise achieves something and i think paul should know because they didn't have cars back then right they had to walk long distances. They didn't, well, they had horses and camels and stuff, but, you know, they didn't have bikes or motorcycles or, or little tuk-tuks. <laughs> but, um, so he would know what he's talking about here. So when I think 
uh, Paul is saying here is, is that the exercise of reverence has a much wider benefit because it deepens and strengthens every aspect of our Christian life and our service. And it prepares us for eternity. For bodily exercise profits to a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come for eternity, right? So it also prepares us for to come the day when we're with the Lord for all of eternity. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> and that day is coming soon. Praise God. Amen. If worship is stripped of reverence, then reverence will be a small thing in our life, in every other aspect of our life, right? What begins in worship spreads to every area. What's inward, what sits on the throne of our heart, who sits on the throne of our heart, you know, that, that reverence and that fear is going to extend to every other area in our life. If worship is more like a performance, right? And we're just showing off and we're imitating the world. If we just want a sensation, you know, and we want, and everything is about me and what pleases me, then reverence is not going to be found in every area of our life, any area. <laughs> so it's not good then for us to abandon reverence and worship, godly, God-fearing worship of our King. We will be seriously hurt and lacking in our spiritual lives. So it does make a great difference makes a huge difference. I'm just going to go through some things right now um, of things that are associated with reverence. In 2 Corinthians 7, Paul mentions the repentance of the Corinthians. He said, when you repented of your sins, there was such a heart searching. You were all sensitive in your sense of right and wrong. What hatred of yourselves was shown? What zeal and enthusiasm you had to get rid of the wrong. You had such reverence for God and awareness of his holiness that you longed for God and to accept you. And you were really sorry and struggled to get this stuff right. Reverence for God says, I must leave this sin behind. I must obtain his pardon and forgiveness before I do anything else, because God sees, he sees me, he is omnipresent, and God does keep his eyes on us, he's always watching, he's searching to and fro throughout all the earth, and he's everywhere all at once, and, and I, in my um, teachings on praise and worship, I, I talk further and more in depth on, on the omnipresence of the Lord, but, uh, but I won't do it here. Um, uh, reverence gives birth to great diligence. We can always run to God as a child, runs to his father, but not without reverence and respect. Because our Heavenly Father demands holiness, and he severely hates sin. He hates sin. And again, I have to say, if this kind of reverence doesn't begin in worship, it will never grow and survive in our lives. It won't. Reverence for God does not forget that he looks at our reaction to circumstances and remembers that God knows best and that he provides and trains us for our eternal good. Reverence never doubts the Lord and certainly can't be bitter against him. Amen? Reverence takes us through many, many hard times, many hard times, and sees us through a new, uh, the new phases of joy and peace. New phases. I mean, there's a depth in our joy where we grow more joyful and more joyful and contented in the Lord. 
you know, and in 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 our peace that that you know when circumstances come in our life, we're not so easily moved. The first thing we do is we give thanks to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this circumstance because I know you're going to work mighty things through it in my life, and I'm going to come to a place in my life where I'm going to be more joyful and more dependent on you and and changed you know and and i'll have a deeper depth in my fear and reverence for you and a lot of us are experiencing that right now i know of a few that are just experiencing that brokenness and the the joy of the lord it, you know the depth of that in their lives today. Through reverence, we're not going to think wrong thoughts about each other. This is a big one because we'll have a respect and appreciation for one another because remember, it first begins in our reverence and awe for God. And if we have the spirit of Christ in us, we're not going to be going around dishonoring one another and, and, um, you know, disrespecting one another. We'll have a respect and appreciation for one another. Reverence for God holds us to the truth. God observes and disciplines and rewards according to our conduct. Right? This kind of reverence will never be kept in us if it's not exercised and developed first in our time of worship to the Lord. Now, I know I'm not going to be too popular on this one for what I'm about to say, but it's it's got to be said. And it's not being said from the pulpit too many places. And what I've noticed in a lot of churches is we come to church, there's such irreverence. And I know the churches are are just coming, we're just coming out of this pandemic and um, the mask thing and, and this, you know, the big C and and a lot of churches are now starting to congregate again together. Uh, but for the longest time, it was mostly online. But um, as, as we're all coming back together, old habits die hard, right? People bringing in their cell phones. What I've noticed in a lot of churches, we come to church, there's such irreverence. And I've seen it in the past, year after year after year. And we come into the, the service with our food and, and, you know, we have our cell phones ringing off and we're talking to people on our phones. We're leaving the, the service to go talk to someone and, and we're texting people during the message and the singing and we're not focused. You know, shut our phones off. Shut them off. Show respect for God. I've been guilty of this myself. I mean, I understand if you're, 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 you know, you're waiting for, for the, uh, that call, a call from a loved one, you know, who's, you know, they're in the hospital and, and just different circumstances. There, there is a line to be drawn though, right? You know, don't, don't bring your food in the sanctuary and be sitting there munching on something while the pastor's preaching. That is so disrespectful towards the pastor and disrespectful to God. Shut your phones off. Eat and drink before you come to church, you know? There's a, there's a time and a place for that. Uh, we talk. We, the, there's power in our tongue. You know, death and life are in the power of the tongue. We're talking when we're not supposed to be talking. It also says in um, Matthew 12, 37, by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So Christians... A lot of times live, live defeated lives, frustrated, they're unhappy, lies because of what comes out of our mouths. And it was never intended for God's children to speak lies, to gossip, uh, to, to bring accusations against one another, to doubt, um, doubts and fears against one another, you know, being suspicious all the time. You know, was she talking about me? Is, you know, what's, you know, that, that, Spirit never intended that God's children should, should be like this. And the same goes for when we come into the house of God. We shouldn't spend time talking um, about all the 
troubles, there's a time and a place for that. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But when that's the only thing we're talking about is the troubles and the sicknesses and the weather and what we had for dinner last night and what movie we watched that we shouldn't have been watching, you know, and, you know, all the business and, and the in-laws and the outlaws and whatever, you know, yes, there's a place for that, but not in the context of a church service. We are to walk in the spirit, sit in heavenly places with Christ and the, the words of our mouth are to be acceptable in his sight. I mean, it's all right if, a sister or a brother comes to you and they're asking you for counsel or for advice. Well, then you, you go aside and you talk to them, you know, but, but there's no place for gossip and for putting one another down and all this stuff. The only way we'll ever be uh, acceptable in his sight, we have to watch our words. We have to have words of praise and victory. The only way we'll ever inherit heavenly promises is to stop walking in the natural realm and start acting like sons and daughters of God. Let your words be anointed of the Spirit so they can minister grace and edification to the hearers, right? That's what the Word of God says to everyone else around us. Don't worry. I'm not pointing fingers here. You know, this applies to me first. Don't worry. God has been dealing with me in this past few months about this. And very strictly, because this has to be cut out of our lives, right? Cut out of our lives. Now, I want to ask, do you think we, all, we do all this because there isn't a fear of God and a reverence for God in our lives? We've lost that. Hmm. We don't have that sense of awe anymore. And at the risk of offending some, you think it's because we don't have the right mindset when we come to worship the Lord. I think this kind of reverence and awe and the fear of God that the Bible is referring to is missing in a lot of our lives. A lot of the church, <laughs> the body of Christ. Not the church building, because we're the stones that God's knitting together. You know, we're his, his living stones. We have to watch our attitudes and our behavior toward God. We're not, we're not being taught or exampled it in, in a lot of cases. And in no way am I saying this in a judgmental way. This is what the Lord's put on my heart. He showed me this. Over a period of time, as I was uh, getting this um, praise and worship teaching together, and he said, okay, come come with me. I want to show you some things about yourself. You know, and it, it's, it's, uh, and I observed this within the church today, and it troubles me. And, and any of you ever been troubled about something in your spirit? You know, that something just doesn't sit right? What I've noticed is that Wherever reverence has been thrown out of worship, even the dress code changes. We need to desire this reverence in our lives. This is the gymnastics of reverence. Reverence for God keeps us in balance. Whatever our personality, whatever our gifts, for example, I may be gifted, um, this may be an odd example, but with a, a sense of humor. We need to be careful even in our sense of humor. You know, I, I don't think I am, mind you. I think I'm more corny than anything. But um, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> but if I have reverence for God, I will have a serious side. I won't be always going around telling jokes and being... I was even sarcastically joking and um, always everything's a joke. You know, I can't be serious for a minute. We, we also, you know, have to carry a mature conversation with others. Be mature. 
I will know when it's time to be funny and when it's time to be serious. Because if I don't, then I've probably failed to have reverence for God in some area. When I'm always going around joking and not taking people serious and not listening, you know, seriously. There's no depth there at all, definitely. Wherever there is a lack of reverence, you'll find in a Christian's life that they always want to have things their way. You know, it's always their way. They don't want to work hard in the service of the Lord. They leave it for others to do all the time. It's always that 10% in the church, right, that are doing everything. And the 90, you know, that they just show up five minutes before service, whatever. They don't want to die to self. They don't want to die to self in their stewardship. Reverence influences all these areas. We want to be eager to help. We want to be eager to serve. When we exercise reverence in our lives, it benefits every area of our lives that produces a healthy measure of seriousness. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you can't joke. I'm not saying, you know, there's a place for that. There's a healthy measure of seriousness, consciousness, and a respect of God's word and the zeal for the work of God. So how's our reverence doing? Have we missed it? And I've been saying this over and over and over and over the word reverence, fear of God, worship. Reverence and worship is the fundamental, fundamental starting point. If we take that away, take that away, and there's no hope that will even remotely look like God's people, the kind of people that God wants us to be anyways, right? Do we treat God as common? Do we you know, say, yo, homie, yo, homie. Is that how we talk to God? Do we respect him as savior, king, deity? <laughs> yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's loving. He's gracious. But this whole friend thing, I mean, this friend mentality, has caused us to lose the respect that we should have for God. We should never call Jesus Christ, yo, JC, no, or homie. He's not your homie. He's our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's not our buddy. He's not our sugar dad. That we, we can just hang out any old way we please. I know the word of God says that we are friends of God in, in John 15, 14. But there's a condition attached to that. This friend thing. If ye do whatever I command you. So we have to remember that our God is first a holy God. What would our reaction be if the Lord Jesus were to show up right now, right before us? I think, I know I would get on my face. I would bow in his presence. I would fall on my face and worship him. Matthew 28, 9 says, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, God met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. They worshipped him at his feet. Even the angels worshipped in Revelation 7.11. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. He is God. He created everything. He created all things. He created this. He created the snow. He created the sunshine. He created the clouds. 
He created the universe. All things he created. He created you and I perfectly. This should be our response. Oh God, oh great God. <laughs> he is above and we are so humble. We humble ourselves in his presence. Amen. We could look at this another way. I mean, how come we give more respect? Um, okay. When we go to funerals, when we go to weddings, or when we go um, to, for a business interview, for a job or something, we get all dressed up, we put our makeup on, we do our hair all pretty, and we, you know, get all dressed really nice and put our ties and our suits on, but yet we come to the house of God and we're dressed so casually ripped in jeans sometimes an old t-shirt that we slept in the night before maybe i don't know but um we dress casual and however we want and sometimes i think we even forget to dress sometimes now come on ladies let's be serious let's get serious here i've been in many churches many churches where you know those tight tight skin tight black um whatever leggings or whatever well they're supposed to be under something longer than your knees or just above your knees not with a short shirt with just that on it's like go home and dress will you sorry but and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to judge as a mature older woman in the faith I'm trying to give advice to the younger crowd, the younger ladies in the faith. Um, sometimes we forget to dress. It was once said to me by a more mature lady than me. Um, and it really hit home. And I always use the example that if half the women in our churches walked by the nursery, all of the babies would start crying. And you know why that is? because they think it was feeding time. That's why, because everything's pulled down, you know, and it's like, oh my goodness. Now I wanna be careful, I wanna clarify this. I'm not talking about the unsaved. Those who come into church off the streets or whatever, we're bringing our friends to church and they're unsaved, or maybe they just got saved. But if you've been in church for 40 years and you're still doing this, oh my goodness. You know, they don't know any better. They don't know any better. But as God's people, we need to example modesty and holiness. Even when we're, we're, we're leaving our homes to go shopping or to go wherever, to be in public with other people, we have to be careful because we're in the presence of the king we're in the presence of our king this not only goes for our dress code but for how we conduct ourselves in his service as far as the things mentioned earlier you know you know i really believe that those quiet times in our worship service is because it represents an obedience and a humble and a reverent spirit Habakkuk 2.20 says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Worship is a reverence and a holy time. Amen. It is in complete contrast to all the singing and the music. Ecclesiastes 3.7 says, there is a time to keep silent and a time to speak. Those times when it's uh, really quiet in church, we're singing and all of a sudden whew, it just comes very quiet and the room is silent and we're just standing there in the presence of the Lord. I think those are the two hearts of men and a word of prophecy is about to come forth. He's dealing with the hearts of men. He's revealing himself to us. 
And there are these are the usually the times that a word comes forth of encouragement or a prophetic word or something. Um, singing in tongues with the interpretation. And if we're not sensitive to his spirit, we can miss the whole thing. And we leave the service feeling, eh, meh. You know, we, we, we leave the same way we came. And that should never be the case. Never. Whenever we come out of God's presence, something should be changed in us. We should be stirred up with feelings of reverence. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still within our spirit. We should want to worship and serve him in this way. I know the Lord is growing me and many of us here in our worship and reverence for the Lord and in being totally devoted in our commitment to him. If we don't have this in our walk, then we really need to pray for this reverence and the fear of God. And I've been seeking him in this area because I need more revelation in this area for my own life. But yeah, we miss it. I miss it. I miss it. But I come to him and I say, Lord, forgive me. Teach me, Holy Spirit, how to worship in spirit and truth. When we recognize how worthy God is of our worship, we should bow and honor him and be on our faces and in awe, falling on our knees and on our faces in fear and reverence of a holy God. As Isaiah did, woe is me, I have come undone. When we even catch a glimpse of God <laughs> is when we fall to pieces before him. I'd like to say that happens to me every time, but it doesn't. But do I desire that? Yes, I do. And I pray that the Lord stirs that hunger up in me. We really begin to see and realize almighty God, just how small we are compared to his greatness. Amen. The awesome thing, though, is God Almighty, he calls us to have fellowship with him and to get to know him in a deep and reverent way. Even though he knows, <laughs> he knows us intimately, but he calls us and he invites us to come in. And through the blood of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, we can. But there is a right way. And there's a wrong way. And if the Lord allows, maybe, you know, we'll get into the praise and worship teachings that he's um, given me over the years. And, um, well, it's in his timing, right? Amen. So, Father, I bless your name today. And I thank you for this, this time together, Lord, just searching your scriptures and hearing what you have to say, Lord, and the awesome responsibility we have, Lord, as believers, to be stirred up in our reverence and our awe for you. Lord God, that we would exercise that daily. That's a responsibility that we have, Lord, the process of sanctification. You know, we have to be obedient, Lord. Help us to be obedient, Lord, to walk in spirit and in truth, but to look into these matters that your word talks about, Lord, and what it means to be in awe of you and to fear your name and reverence you. Lord, please, Lord, do a mighty work in our lives in this area. Lord God, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you would fill us today. Fill our hearts, Lord, today in Jesus' name. That we would be mindful of you as we go about our business today, Lord. Be very mindful of you, that you are always with us. And you are watching. You are watching over us, Lord. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, as you can tell, it's pretty bright for 
morning time, I'll let you in on a little secret. And I think heaven's calling knows this. We don't always record early in the morning. <laughs> but as we are coming to you in the morning, we say, good morning. Right? So I just had to get that off my chest. Well, have a blessed day. I love you. Um, and uh, God loves you. And let's pray for one another. In Jesus' mighty name, have a blessed day. Bye. Bible with the Holy Spirit showing you 